I give you the floor. Okay. And thank you for this uh, unexpected added value to our okay. English for Environment uh, Environment uh, training course. Thank you okay. for the participants, and now it's up to you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Stefano, uh, and uh, yeah, th thank you for um, let's say uh, allowing me to uh, to do this extra session uh, within the uh, the environment of the uh, the English for the Environment course. Um, okay, so what I wanted to do today is I wanted to just sort of um, do two things mainly, um, but I'd like to just spend a few minutes explaining uh, what this what this extra thing is about. Um, over well over over quite a number of years, uh, starting maybe about 2005 2006, um, I started to develop an interest in systems uh, and in particular in systems thinking which is um, something which uh, let's say um, I sort of carried along with my uh, then professional life which was uh, working in a company um, and I came across this because um, it's it's very much linked it was very much linked to to the work that I was doing at the time which was uh, portfolio management uh, not going to go into that at all um, but basically I've I sort of carried I've always carried forward this let's say this interest in systems and systems thinking um, but the more I sort of got into it the more I realized that many people in fact most people have never heard of it got no idea what it is and yet we spend every day all day uh, living in systems okay uh, and so uh, this was let's say where the, the the basic let's say interest came from um, but as sort of as time has gone on um, and particularly with uh, with me changing, let's say, changing direction in my life and uh, moving into more education sort of stuff, and then more particularly in the last sort of five or ten years with the uh, the increasing interest in um, uh, increasing interest in in climate and the, the the climate emergency, which is now, let's say, it's now upon us. Um, this interest, this personal interest in systems, has sort of come back, uh, and it's really come to the fore. And so, what I'm going to show you today is actually something which. Um, uh, is very 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 closely linked to the sort of stuff that I was uh, that I I, I, uh, I actually did a, a couple of years a university diploma in this stuff so uh, I was so interested in it <laughs> so this is for me this is nice because this is bringing let's say a part of uh, a part of my um, a part of my let's say working background uh, in a company together with uh, my scientific background which is really sort of uh, um, part of my part of who I am so it's pulling these things together so um, the only thing is though that this system stuff can be quite tricky it can be quite difficult because um, it involves a certain amount of um, in some cases counterintuitive thinking um, but also it involves maybe looking at things in a slightly different way okay so um, what what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to show you uh, first of all, uh, I'm going to try and show you some of the basic ideas behind uh, this thinking about climate change and more than anything else, what we can do about it as a system. Uh, and then I'm going to show you the tool. Uh, and the tool is actually a model. It's actually a simulator. And it's extremely powerful. Uh, 
but I think you have to you have to have a little bit of background to get the to get the most from this now that said um, I'm going to share my screen and okay let me just say uh, da -da -da. hi everyone I think there we go um, right share where am I here we go let's see if this works and I think it's this one I don't want to share that okay I think this should start okay so you should be able to see my uh, yes. PowerPoint okay yeah Fantastic. we see it okay right so um, there's a disclaimer here uh, the reason why there is a disclaimer here is because the En-ROADS materials are uh, are let's say owned and used by uh, Climate Interactive which is affiliated with MIT um, however the way the materials are structured on the web uh, they are completely useless as a presentation <laughs> okay now um, they're usually used for um, for uh, what we call facilitated workshop sessions so maybe half a day or a day or whatever and they it, it's uh, it's like a handout it's like a book it's like that type of thing which is completely unadaptable unadapted to to this particular context so what I've done is I've taken some I've taken the key points and I put them on some slides uh, I'm going to walk through these but then I'm going to go into the model um, and I will show you how things actually work now um, it would be, it would be fantastic if at some point maybe uh, in the future we would be able to actually meet up and do a do a real session on this but what I'm doing now is I'm communicating about the the model so that you can go and find out more about it yourselves okay so um, I'm going to talk about where it comes from uh, how it's made how you can use it I'm not going to go into any of the let's say the the heavy technical details um, but I hope to convince you that um, this isn't something which came out of a let's say um, uh, a random uh, a random piece of work this is this is the fruit of uh, a lot of very very intense thinking over quite a long time so okay so En-ROADS um, okay so let me just go into here okay so I have to start with my friend Mencken because this is this is my this is let's say my my compass this is my north because it's this reflects what you're going to see um, because climate change is complex it's an extremely complex system and we're going to look at why there are uh, there, there is this complexity but I just want to us I want us to always bear in mind <laughs> that for every complex problem there is an answer that is clear simple and wrong okay so in other words if you have a complex situation and you are trying to impl impose a simple solution you are not going to get anywhere with it okay you're just going to get frustrated okay or at worst you will end up blaming someone else okay so let's just bear this in mind so complexity is lying underlying this this problem so I'm going to start now this is a bit it's a bit busy but I've tidied it up a little bit for those of you who who were here last last time um, we ended up I think we did a the last half hour we did a uh, a little bit of a graph uh, a little bit of a a picture a map and this map was about the carbon cycle because the carbon cycle is key to what we're going to talk about today um, so I'm not going to go through this in any detail whatsoever I'm just I've just brought it up to remind ourselves where we were and if you remember we had this idea of the bathtub in the middle and we have these uh, let's say these flows of carbon between different elements of this this is the earth system essentially it's actually a very simplified version of the earth system but it's the earth system and what we said 
if you remember, was that we have backwards and forwards flows between uh, things like vegetation and soils, uh, between the seas, uh, between the sea and the sea life and the phytoplankton and all of that stuff. Um, and then you have longer term geological processes going on. And then you've got human activity. And in fact, um, what this simulator or what this simulation uh, is about is very much about this part. Okay, because this is the part which is um, altering and which is modifying the flows between uh, between the other parts of the of the system. Okay, so in, in particular, we're looking at the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Now, I've included, I've taken the sea out because the sea is is big and it has this. It's like a, a big physical chemical system that sort of uh, goes on uh, and on for itself. I'm not saying that human activity doesn't have any impact on the sea because that's obviously not true. Um, but when we are talking about doing something, um, we don't say, "Oh, I'm going to I'm going to sponsor a kilo of phytoplankton." We say, "I'm going to plant a tree because trees are something that we can uh, that we can." we can see and we can uh, relate to okay so uh, also since we live on the land it's our use of the land through for example agriculture building cities that type of thing it's our use of the land which also has this this big impact so um, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at this part in particular now just before I move off this slide, I just want to just want to remind you that um, as far as the balances between these arrows are concerned, so this is CO2 being taken up and CO2 being given out, there is an imbalance because quite clearly trees, plants, vegetation, soils um, take in CO2 to where organisms use the CO2 to make their structures to use it they incorporate it into carbohydrates cellulose whatever okay and so there is a there is slightly more is taken in than is given out in respiration okay so there so there is a, a small amount sort of passing over to the the forest the small amount we're talking gigatons okay so we're still talking like <laughs> Um, relatively big numbers that we can't even imagine so okay having said that you may remember that this uh, this human activity um, was was putting in putting into the bathtub a lot more than the net uh, amount that the forests were taking out and that the seas were taking out as well okay so the whole thing is that the system is no longer balanced because of because of this because of our, our activities okay and our activities are obviously based on extraction of old carbon fossilized carbon to get the energy and that energy is let's say uh, the driver the driving force for um, the human activity okay and we will see how important uh, how important energy is because it, it's the key to it's the key to it, um, and in a way it's the CO2, which is a measure of uh, let's say um, it's a measure it's a measure of our energy use, but our our habit of getting energy from the wrong place, which is hydrocarbons. Okay, but let's let's just let's just take this one step at a time okay so um i i don't think i showed this last time i may have done but i, I don't think so um just a couple of uh a couple of words about this because this is a um this is a graph which shows the uh the levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide as measured from ice cores uh, and from Ar uh, the Arctic and Antarctic um, over the last 800,000 years. So um, the data 
is extremely it's extremely solid data it's extremely good data but what you will notice I think the first thing and when I, I, I typically do this exercise with fifth years fifth year classes of uh, in Italian high school so this is the last year of the uh, of the high school and I ask them to sort of tell me something what you know what is it that you see here well of course what you can see is that there's the graph is sort of uh, it's it's sort of going up and down. It's not quite. We're not quite sure whether it's a a, ran, a totally random uh, oscillation or whether it's a sort of a uh, there's some sort of cycle in there. But uh, what you can see is that you have alternating periods of high, relatively high carbon dioxide concentrations and relatively low co uh, carbon dioxide concentrations. And these uh, these correspond uh, to um, periods when the average temperature of the Earth is warmer. So you have what's called an interglacial period, and you have periods where the uh, um, the temperature is, is the average temperature is a lot cooler. And this is a glacial period. Now, curiously enough, um, this is sort of the last. Uh, the very very last part of the the, the century, so we're we're sort of on we're sort of on a um, let's say in, in a warm a relatively warm period. Um, now, because of this scale, you can imagine this. I mean, this is two hundred thousand, so uh, this is a hundred thousand, so it's fifty thousand, twenty five thousand, uh, ten thousand. So the last let's say hundred, two hundred, three hundred years are crushed into this millimeter basically, and what you can see is that the uh, 2019 average uh, measurement for carbon dioxide concentration is well, it's not just a little bit higher. It's actually well uh, 420 compared 410 compared to a previous maximum of about 300. That's a lot. Okay. Now, um, in another, let's say, in another part of my life, I do, I do stuff with uh, process uh, uh, measurements in 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 production companies, and this to me looks like uh, the sort of chart you get when you have a process, which is sort of producing something. The moment that you see a point like this, you know that something has gone wrong with your machine. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is not just a uh, it's not just a random piece of data um, because if we look at the next if we look at the next slide, um, this is the uh, level of atmospheric carbon dioxide, and you can see it's with the time scale expanded. You can see that this is. Um, well, it's moving up, and my question to the students is always, what type of curve, what, or what type of shape do you see here? And occasionally, I will get someone saying it looks like it's exponential, and it is. Okay. Now, um, again, I don't know what the uh, let's say the mathematical preparation of this particular audience is, but just for those of you who are not so sure. Uh, because it's easy to throw uh, fancy words in and say, oh, yeah, yeah, I know what this is. Exponential means that you have something which is doubling um, at a, in a particular time period. So uh, you could have, uh, you could you start off with 10 today. Let's say the period is a week. So next week you have 20, but the week after you don't have 30, you have 40. The week after that, you don't have 40, you have 80. Okay, so what's happening is it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but the time period is always that. So um, what's the problem with exponentials is that once you once they start, once you start to notice them, it's almost too late in the sense that um, you have to act very, very quickly in order to keep them under control. Yeah. So, if we look at this in the historical context of, of let's say, human history on the planet, um, well, 1750, Industrial Revolution, okay, uh, the invention of the steam engine and all of that stuff, extraction of coal, um, 
But notice it sort of bumbled along. It sort of didn't really do much until about 1870 or so. Um, and the, the comment here is that this is when the oil industry developed. Now, oil, uh, petrol, uh, which obviously comes from the, uh, from the Greek meaning um, liquid rock, petros, yeah, uh, it, it, it was known since the ancient times but it hadn't it was always a bit of a curiosity it hadn't really been combined with anything and of course here what did people do well they realized that you could use uh, you could use oil or petrol instead of coal because this is the steam age uh, and so you could start to you could start to use oil instead of coal because it's it's a lot easier and it's a lot more energy dense than uh, than coal to carry around because coal is quite, actually quite heavy. It's a rock, okay. So um, and it was in particular around about 1870, 1880, 1890 um, when oil was discovered near Philadelphia and then in Texas that um, it was the the American Society which essentially pushed the development of oil as a as a fuel. Well and in a way, the rest is the rest is history. Um, but uh, just one of the names which is associated with this development is Rockefeller, uh, and he he had um, uh, he had a a vision for the production of oil, which was complete. It was extremely modern from a certain point of view, completely different to uh, other people at the time. And this was the idea of uh, producing. And transporting and selling, and he had this idea of a supply chain, okay, uh, which was way, way, way ahead of his time. And, uh, and in fact, Standard Oil became uh, a monopoly, which was eventually broken up by the uh, the U.S. government. Not before he'd accumulated, <laughs> he was the Jeff Bezos of the situation. Okay. Anyway, the point here, coming back to our our, our story here. Um, what we have here is we have the emissions of CO2. So uh, this is this is just a level. This is the level in the bathtub. This is the amount <coughs> that people are starting to contribute to the uh, to the bathtub. And of course, uh, you don't. You can see that uh, up until the mid 20th century, it's sort of relatively well. Uh, it's all right. I mean, it's sort of going up a bit, but it's relatively calm. And then all of a sudden, well, this is the post-war boom, uh, and this corresponds to a whole. There's a whole set of factors in here which have meant that because we were already, let's say, we were already married or wedded to to oil, um, this just continued. And of course, uh, uh, oil plastics and all of this sort of stuff this is when uh, everything really started to take off and uh, life was life was good and wonderful and bright future what have you but of course we're now in 2020 and we can see that maybe um, there was a lack of uh, foresight uh, earlier on anyway that's the situation so what we're looking at is we're looking at the level in the bathtub it's the CO2 in the bathtub, okay? Right, so I'm going to introduce En-ROADS. Um, if you have any questions, I, I do keep looking at the chat. If you have any questions, uh, I will try to answer the questions if you, if you type them uh, onto, uh, onto the chat. So um, I'm going to introduce, I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about some system stuff, but just a little bit so that you have an idea of what I'm uh, what I'm trying to get at, and then I'm going to move into some specifics about the the model itself, and then we'll have a look at the the simulator. Okay, and at that point you you can you should be able to take it away and uh, let's say play with it. Okay, so um, this has got to be one of the worst acronyms that I've ever seen. It really is horrible. Um, Energy En Roads, which is nice enough as a name, um, stands for Energy Rapid Overview and Decision Support, which is just complete gobbledygook. Okay, but at least for someone who's from outside. Okay, um, okay, but the, the key here is that it's 
decision support. In other words, making decisions but using data, using numbers, using using um, a let's say a vision of how things could work if you did this. So it's very much about saying if I do this, this is what is likely to happen. Okay. So um, and the other part, energy, is because this model focuses very much on energy use. Okay, and you'll see you'll see from the way it is. But since energy is the absolute keystone for modern society and for mo the, for modern economies, um, you can see you can understand why there is this focus. Okay, so um, the model it's the modeling itself is based on a, is based on a, an area uh, which unless you're sort of in it um, sounds a bit sort of black magic. Um, systems that system dynamics, which is um, an approach which was developed, it developed from uh, a guy called Jay Forrester uh, immediately after the war, who was look actually looking at industrial systems, he's looking at industrial production. Um, but with with time, it became clear that the 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 methods that the way of thinking about things that you could you would apply to those very specific uh, situations because he was looking to make industrial processes uh, better uh, it could also be applied to much broader uh, much broader areas one of the areas which this was picked up in uh, very quickly was actually um, ecology uh, ecosystems so we last time I think we talked about uh, webs and networks and how uh, you have animals inter interrelating with each other um, and if you remember this also I gave you the example of the the foxes and the rabbits and the, the populations and stuff this is essentially one of the classic uh, one of the classic areas where uh, system system dynamics is uh, is um, is applied um, but just because it's biology doesn't make it easy because the mathematics underneath this is pretty horrendous um, which probably explains why which probably explains why it's uh, it hasn't really sort of caught on so easily because you need a certain amount of training to be able to do this stuff but basically um, you get you use programs you use particular computer software and it can be a little bit sort of arcane a little bit uh, a little bit hard but anyway before we get there and don't worry we're not going to go into this don't worry don't worry about that um, just going to introduce a couple of terms so um, the first thing I think we need to think about is uh, this word system now um, it's used in all sorts of contexts in more or less um, let's say uh, more as broad uh, broad contexts more or less broad meaning um, but when we're talking about it when we're using it in this context which is context of system dynamics um, we have to be a bit more careful we have to be a bit more let's say structured about how we use it and a, let's say a good simple definition is uh, of a system is any collection of things that interact together to produce some sort of behavior of the whole okay now one of the key tenants there are, there are a number of let's say things which feed into the idea of the sit of a system um, but one of the key tenants is that a system is more than the sum of its parts and it exhibits what we call emergent behavior so in other words what you get when you see the whole thing is more than what you get if you look at the individual pieces so um, uh, just thinking about uh, particular um, particular examples so for example the um, uh, a living organism, uh, a, um, even a unicellular organism. You're watching an amoeba moving around in a in a petri dish. Um, it's quite obvious that this thing is alive, 
But if you look at it and you analyze it, while it's maybe 25% protein, 33% lipids, and God knows what else, okay, um, it's just a bunch of molecules. Uh, similar thing for our brain, you can, well, for some people's brains, let's say, um, you've got, uh, you've got cells, you've got neurons, you've got neurotransmitters, you, you can go different levels, chemical level, biochemical level, uh, the biological level, the, the histological level, you can, but none of that actually explains or could possibly even predict this, which is me talking to you as a sort of a semi-conscious being, yeah? So this is the idea of, 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 of emergent behavior. And, okay, so living things are one thing, but you can also have, um, let's say, uh, behaviors which come from the way that the system is structured, um, which uh, are counterintuitive in the sense that um, you wouldn't expect the thing to uh, the thing to work the way it does. Um, so one example is traffic in a city. Uh, you have um, uh, you have this idea that there's too much traffic. So what do you do? You make the roads wider, which just means that there are more more people will drive because the roads are wider. Okay. So you've got uh, you've got sometimes you have counterintuitive uh, behaviour in the system as well. Okay. So what what is this about well this is about feedback and the relationship the structures within the system are such that you have um, a set you have causes and so you have causal chains but quite often the causal chains one thing causes another which causes another which causes another but then you find that somehow that chain actually feeds back into the into the, the initial cause and so what you have is we have what what are called feedback loops or causal loops so just to give you just to give you a, a simple example of these loops here um, if you think about a population well the population the number so that's our bathtub um, is going to be uh, is going to depend on the number of births in a year. Now, if you still have, if you only have births in a year, no one is so it's it's only you only have people uh, giving birth. The population is obviously going to increase, and it's just going to keep increasing. So this is positive. However, because we're talking about living things in this case, um, we actually have a negative feedback loop, which is that. In a year, a certain number of people will die, and so you have uh, the populate the level of the population will depend on how many new ones and how many old ones. Okay, so what you have is you will have a a balancing situation. Okay, so you have positive uh, positive loops which amplify and negative loops which suppress. Okay, so in a way, this is put your foot on the accelerator. And this is take your foot off the accelerator and put your foot on the brake. Okay, so this is what's happening. Uh, now, this is a very simple example, but if you can imagine that the population is a is a level, just like our CO2. Um, but if you remember our 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 picture, well, we had some things which are contributing to the the CO2, so human activity. But we've also got other things which are taking CO2 out. So we've got our forests, we've got our sea, uh, sea systems, okay? So, um, but if you dig into that, you will find that there are lots of these loops happening. Um, and some of them, as I say, can be quite counterintuitive. Okay, so uh, systems dynamic, system dynamics is, uh, is the mathematical formulation of these relationships, if you like. Why? Um, it's not to make it esoteric or difficult. It's because it allows people to write computer programs so you can simulate. And it's, it's, this is the power of, of SD because it allows you to make simulations. Now, of course, a simulation, a model is only a model. Um, and it will only be as good as the data and the numbers that you feed it, which is why um, in some cases these... Uh, these these tools can be they 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 they're quite heavily criticised, but in the absence of nothing, 
um, this at least gives you something to, uh, to, to, to debate around. Having said that, certainly for the really advanced climate chain, or the, sorry, the really advanced climate um, calculations which are done, which is a completely different thing to uh, En-ROADS, but the, the, the maths of it is, is basically the same. Um, those, those models have become so sophisticated uh, with advent of uh, massive computing, computer power, computing power, but also uh, the ability to understand as we get more information, more data about the actual Earth system itself, they become ever more refined. So um, coming back to our systems, I know it's, this is just an example. Um, I was looking for a, a crime example because crime tends to be quite s something that people remember. Um, this was the only one that I could find as a picture, um, but it makes. It, let's just think about this because this makes sense, and it also illustrates the. It also illustrates the key point of SD, which is that you are looking at a behaviour in time. So it's not a map. A map is just a photograph. This is a series of maps over time, okay? And that's, I think that's possibly the thing which, could, which uh, makes it difficult for people sometimes because it, it's thinking about how something is evolving in time. How could it evolve? Okay, so very simple model. Um, <clears throat> you have a, an equilibrium situation at the beginning, uh, which is um, you've got the price of the drug, you've got the amount of the drug available, or around, let's say, in the system, um, and you've got um, the amount of crime associated with people needing to do crime to get the money to pay for the drug, okay? So you have also a certain number of... Uh, let's say police busts, police interventions. Um, so you, you increase the number of drug busts. So what does that have? What, what, what effect does that have? Well, it has the effect of causing a shock in the system. So the amount of available uh, drug decreases. Well, the laws of economics state that if you decrease the supply of something, the cost will go up. So of course, if the cost goes up, uh, where are people going to get the money from? Well, the money will come from uh, from petty crime used to uh, fund uh, the drug habit until the system goes back to equi equilibrium. Okay, so uh, this is the I the idea here is that by acting now the number of drug busts, this is the chief superintendent of an area saying, mm, okay, the government's told me that we need to do 10 more this month. Okay, so that's what they do. Um, this is policy. Okay, and this is, the, this is the, the thing that we need to be looking at in, uh, need to be considering in En-ROADS. Because if we, if we are saying we're going to decarbon the economy, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. This is policy, this is political decision. Okay? Okay, so um, En-ROADS as a model is very sophisticated. Uh, it's very, let's say, um, uh, it's very up to date. It uses the the, the latest research, so it's constantly being, it's constantly evolving. Um, the main structure is what it is defined, but the it's the um, the details which are uh, which get adjusted according to as 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 time as time goes on. Um, what that does is it refines that it makes you more confident. It gives you more confidence in the answers that you get. So, um, the simulation itself is rooted in uh, in some factors uh, which are known to influence policy. So one key factor, one key, um, let's say, uh, characteristic of systems is uh, there's, there's always a delay between acting and getting the result. If you want the, the classic example which is used to describe this in systems terms is when you go, when you have a shower, okay, and you 
turn on the hot water and you get in and it's too hot so you add some cold but you add too much and so the temperature goes down too far and then you have to play with the hot and the cold water there's a delay in reaching the the temperature that you want okay there's all uh, Okay, uh, we'll we'll come we'll come to these in in a, in a minute. Um, okay, so the so the the idea is that the or the, the the concept is that there will be some delays. So you act now, but maybe you don't see the results immediately. Um, there is also uh, the fact that you may go around these loops, but there may be uh, um, an effectiveness. So let's say you make a change and you start to bring in uh, you start to bring in more um, uh, alternative uh, energy sources and they're cheaper and there will be an effectiveness that will increase with time. For example, um, there's an, an economic aspect which is uh, sensitivity to price. So if tomorrow petrol for your car suddenly doubled in price you would definitely think about whether whether it's worth buying an electric bike, for example. Um, there's also an element of uh, where did things come from? So in, in this particular case, in the En-ROADS case, we're looking at how uh, how there's been historical growth in, uh, in energy sources. Now, this may seem a little bit ab abstract, but actually this is to do with explaining what we have now as the result of what was decided years ago, okay, um, and re recognizing that just because you're going to decarbon an economy, decarbonize an economy, you're not going to shut down your coal power stations tomorrow, okay. So there's a there's a there's an inertia in the system, uh, there's a, and that fits with the the, the time lag, um, and then of course there's also another factor which is that um, particularly when we're talking about energy, uh, the um, there is a potential for uh, improved uh, efficiency, of course. Okay, so taking all of these things into account, En-ROADS will uh, is looking at system-wide effects of different um, different actions. Now, using these, uh, we call them levers. If we remember a lever. Uh, is something which it's a machine, it's a very simple machine for amplifying force and that is exactly what this is about, it's about uh, trying to use things which uh, cause a change which then amplifies, okay? Okay, so En-ROADS as a model um, is structured around this in particular Okay, so the temperature and the impact, so sea level change and all that sort of stuff, is stuff which is a consequence of the temperature going up, which is a consequence of this. Okay, so this is, let's say, the, the, the underlying causal, uh, causal link. This is what we... This is what we measure. This is what we actually observe. Okay, um, the temperature is just remember temperature is just a measure of internal energy, internal heat of a system, um, and uh, one of the one of the key things here is uh, to try and understand this idea of um, limiting uh, limiting. The in, an increase in temperature. So thinking about the Paris, uh, the Paris goals from 2016, uh, the idea or the, the 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 agreement was to try and limit the increase to uh, to 2.0 uh, degrees centigrade or Celsius. Um, better if it's 1.5. Okay. Now. Two degrees doesn't sound very much, and I think this is another aspect, particularly around the climate change debate. Uh, two degrees does not sound very much, um, and so you could ask, well, why why only two degrees? Because I mean, it, it, you know, it, it, if it's if it's just a little bit warmer, surely that can't make much difference. Well, <clears throat> the problem is that um, the physics. The physics and the chemistry are underneath all of this because in the end, Earth, the Earth system is chemistry and physics. Um, 
is such that uh, the functions involved are all exponentials. So you're talking about the Boltzmann distribution for molecular velocities, and that's an exponential. And so as soon as you make a small change, you get a big change in the distribution, and that means that there's a lot more energy around in the system. And when there's a lot more energy around in the system, things are moving a lot faster, and you get more extreme, uh, more extreme results. So this is why this is why this idea of even small changes, one degree, doesn't sound very much. Well, actually, one degree is is a lot from a from a physical chemical point of view on the scale of the Earth. Okay, so. Okay, so this is this is what the model sort of focuses on, but in particular, it focuses on this part because uh, where does this CO2 come from, or the greenhouse greenhouse gases? Where do they come from? Well, of course, they come from uh, land use. They come from um, other uh, other activities because because it's not just CO2, of course, um, but CO2 is the big one, and this is where we link to these underlying, uh, these underlying uh, factors, which are population, consumption, energy intensity, and carbon intensity. Now, these two will be, probably be unfamiliar. Um, but basically, this is how much energy you can get out of, let's say, a, piece, a kilo of your energy source. So a piece of coal has a certain energy density or intensity, uh, a litre of petrol has another uh, energy intensity, okay, so this is what this is uh, referring to. Um, and carbon intensity is sort of linked to this because it's saying how much carbon is actually involved in that energy intensity, okay, so if you think about coal, coal uh, is, or carbone in, in Italian, is um, mostly carbon. It's just C, okay? Petrol is hydrocarbons. So you've got some, you've got quite a bit of hydrogen in there as well, and it's a mixture of stuff, okay? So you have different, if you're burning hydrogen, there's no carbon at all, okay? So according to what, where you where you are getting your energy from, um, you will have uh, a different carbon intensity. This links to the idea of the carbon footprint. Okay, so uh, just to give you some ideas, so greenhouse gases, um, always bear in mind our bathtub, so we are concentrating on CO2, but the, uh, the, there are other things in there, in the bathtub, let's say. Um, it approximately uh, accounts for about 65% of the uh, of the of the, the bath, bathtub contributions, let's say, and this is burning coal, oil, gas, and biomass. Okay, now um, I just want to make a, a comment here about this word, and particularly the, the prefix bio, because it's uh, used and it's abused, uh, more abused than used, I think, um, and. For many people, bio is synonymous with good, and non-bio is synonymous with bad. Um, that's a bit of a manichaeistic way of looking at the world, let's say. Um, and it's not quite like that, because uh, biomass here refers to burning wood, burning vegetation, anything which you burn, uh, which is veg vegetable in origin, as a fuel, okay? So um, it's not necessarily just because it's bio, it just doesn't necessarily mean it's it's good, okay? Um, okay, so we've got land use. This is typically agriculture, cutting down trees to make fields for cows, okay? Uh, so together these are about 70, 72%, okay? Um, we've got the rest of the rest of the greenhouse gases are made up of methane. Uh, nitrogen oxides and the uh, hydrofluorocarbon gases. Now, this is an interest. This is a, a cautionary tale because um, the HFCs were introduced to replace the CFCs, 
uh, and the CFCs were displaced because they were um, they were destroying the ozone hole, and the ozone hole story started in the 70s, 60s and 70s as more measurements became available, um, and so the the whole thing was that well we need to stop using CFCs, the chlorofluorocarbons. So they were phased out and the hydrofluorocarbons were brought in um, to do essentially the same job. These are used in refrigerators. They're used to in the uh, cooling cycles in refrigerators. Um, the problem is that while these have no particular pro they're not particularly problematic for the ozone layer, um, they are problematic from the point of view of uh, sorry from the point of view of the um, uh, of, the, of the greenhouse effect. I'm going to show you in a minute what I mean by that. Okay, now we've got some carbon dioxide removal. We said about uh, vegetation, etc. Okay, so the model, En-ROADS, concentrates on the link between the carbon dioxide in the bathtub, production of energy in terms of how much CO2 is being produced, and the last piece of the jigsaw is to link that production of energy to socio-economic activities, in other words, people. And this is the guy who, uh, who did a lot of the pioneering uh, work around this. But basically, what, he's do what he did, what uh, Kaya did, or yeah, he did, I mean, he's still, he's still around, I think, um, is he linked through some through this calculation, it's just simply multiplication. Um, people, GDP, gross, dom gross domestic product per, per person, okay, in other words, how much money is being earned, okay, um, how much energy is being used to generate that GDP, okay, and how much carbon is in that energy, in that energy source, okay, it's a bit, it's a bit maybe. Um, well, I don't know whether it is complicated. It's just maybe a little bit unusual to think about these things. But of course, this is these things are linked. If you, it's well known that if you're going to increase the GDP of a country, you have to you, you use more energy, because you do more activities. You do there's more economic activity. Um, so all of these factors together contribute to this the, the CO2 emissions from uh, from the energy production okay so this is uh, this is the Chi identity I, and I put this here because when we look at the model uh, we're going to see some graphs now don't worry too much about the details here but basically uh, Kaya uh, summarized the situation in five graphs okay and population growth, Notice this is time, always time. Uh, the intensity of the G energy intensity of the G GDP. Your GDP can go up, but if you get more efficient at using the energy, your energy intensity will fall. Will 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 fall. Okay. Um, so uh, essentially, what uh, what Kaya has done is he's created a, a sort of a set of uh, let's say a set of meters, a set of graphs, which allow us to see what is happening when we do when we do particular things. We'll see this in the model. But coming down to reducing uh, the CO2 emissions comes down to four basic things: people consuming less, more efficiently. And using less carbon. That's the that that's the let's say that's the the summary of the whole thing. But we're going to see we're going to see what's how this plays out in the model. So uh, some trends over time. Um, the global population is not getting any smaller. Uh, the UN projections is that by the end of the century, there will be about 11 billion people, just under 11 billion people on the planet. But it will more or less have leveled off. Um, why? Well, again, one of the characteristics of growing economies is that as people become more affluent, they tend to have fewer children. They tend to have smaller families. Okay. Um, at the same time, uh, the GDP, uh, gross domestic product per person, is steadily growing. 
okay and in particular in places like China India South Africa Mexico Brazil um, India for example is a has a a phenomenally large, uh, uh, let's say, middle class, which are the sort of professionals. Uh, there's something like 250, 300 million people that fall into that category, and China is similar. Um, the energy intensity, in other words, the amount of energy needed to generate this, is decreasing. Okay. Um, what this means is that we are putting or we're using less energy for the same output or more output, uh, better technologies, as you shift from manufacturing to services, um, which is a shift which has happened in some Western countries, some more than others. Um, but there's been a sort of a move away from manufacturing as the manufacturing has gone to other parts of the world. Um, this is expected to decrease significantly um, and the carbon intensity of the energy, in other words how much carbon is in the energy sources is also expected to decline um, as there is a shift away from uh, the fossil fuels, the carbon rich fossil fuels towards, uh, towards low, ca uh, low carbon uh, energy sources. Okay, so um, just a couple of notes about the, uh, just a couple of factors to consider when we look at the model, and then let's we're going to have a look at the model. So, what's driving the the, the situation? Okay, so remembering that we actually have a an equation which has four four contributors, but they're not all pulling in the same direction. This is what makes it complicated, because according to how you model or according to how you predict things will happen here um, you will have uh, different levels of, of effects okay and the model is about well what can we do to improve the energy density what can we do to decarbon okay so you always have this uh, you always have this, this this balance between forces which are pulling in different directions so Looking at the greenhouse gases, um, this is quite. I think this is quite a, a telling slide because this dot is. If this were the effect of uh, a molecule of carbon dioxide, um, it repre it's represented by this dot in terms of its ability to um, uh, to affect the temperature. Okay, so this is its greenhouse. Uh, greenhouse ability. Um, methane is about 20 times approximately, okay, um, but notice these are the hydrofluorocarbons, okay. Uh, this one is enormous. This is one of the ones which is most widely used as well. So what does this say? It's saying that you do not need a lot of these things around to have a big effect. So even though there's, we may be talking hundreds hundreds of tons that hundreds of tons is still a lot okay because it has a it has a disproportionate effect okay now you're probably thinking well okay so how do we how do we get around this well uh, or where does this become important well it becomes important in things like uh, the food chain food supply chain not food chain in an ecosystem but where you're talking about uh, refrigeration where you're talking about having to keep things uh, cool um, methane is important in livestock management because uh, it's well known that cows and other ruminants produce lots of methane um, and so even though the quantities, the numbers may be, well, they're relatively contained, actually, there's, there are a lot of cows in the world. Um, overall, uh, there can be big, uh, there can be big effects. Okay, so it, we're not just talking about uh, solar panels on the roof. We're also talking about changing, for example, diet. We're talking about changing um a whole set of things that uh, uh, a whole set of factors so we'll look at those um, we have economic factors come into play so for example um, where you have supply and demand so uh, can, can we afford to transition well look at this this I thought this was really quite amazing um, <clears throat> the price of a solar panel per watt this is a hundred dollars 
just over $100, 1975 Now we're down at, well, 61 cents. And this is 2015. And it hasn't fallen off. It's still getting, uh, th these things are getting more and more effective. They're getting cheaper and cheaper and more and more um, diffused. Okay. What does this tell us from the system's point of view? It tells us that once you get over a certain uh, over a certain threshold, um, you can start having economies of scale. And what this means is every time you go around the loop, you're gaining more. So you're, you're uh, you are reducing costs, which means more people, which increases the market, which means more people invest in the thing, and the whole thing sort of takes off. So. Uh, so solar and there's a similar graph for wind power as well um, <clears throat> the costs have really really fallen uh, dramatically and continue to fall so the question would be is this going to happen with hydrogen that's a very very good question I think okay um, another thing that we may see or that we will see in the model is the idea of peak oil uh, peak oil is the idea well of course, there's only so much oil in the world. Um, it's actually quite a lot, but it's a question of whether it's available. And um, the idea is that the peak <coughs> is around about now, whether it's passed or whether we're still there. Um, of course, with new technologies, people can find, can extract all sorts of things from all sorts of places. Um, but you are starting to get into um, much more environmental awareness about the the costs the the real costs of uh, of extractive technologies so one of the one of the criticisms that you can level at econ uh, eco economists uh, who uh, who look at uh, oil economists who look at uh, extraction of oil is that they hardly ever factor in the let's say the true cost, the life cycle cost of um, of the uh, of the whole extraction so that's uh, that's cleaning up afterwards and that's the same for just about all of the extractive industries um, they get what they need and then they move on and the problem is left with the local community okay uh, this sounds a bit sounds a bit technical capital capital stock turnover sounds a bit sort of uh, business-ish um, Basically, what this means is that um, if you build a power station today running on coal, you're not going to decommission it tomorrow. It's going to be there for 30 years. And people are still building power stations because of the need for energy. Uh, I can't remember how many China is building, uh, along with other things, but they're still building coal-powered uh, coal powered power stations and this means that they will still be active for a long time um, on average it's been calculated that about 3% of uh, power stations are run down every year but that's not a, that's not a big turnover okay so um, we have to this is another thing which contributes to the um, inertia the inertia in the system. Okay. Uh, on a similar scale, but slightly more compressed, uh, we have the uh, conversion energy efficiency, energy usage. So um, I've, well, I think everyone will have noticed that over the last few years there has been a huge increase in hybrids and or electric cars and all sorts of stuff, electric things on the roads. Um, Improved energy efficiency is fantastic. Uh, there's, a, there's all sorts of stuff going on, um, but at, at the same time, there's still a hell of a lot of old vehicles, 20 years old, 30 years old. And if you apply this to this thinking to, for example, the uh, the, the vehicles used by companies, it's clear that uh, large-scale electric uh, HGVs or uh, LKVs or whatever they're called, these huge 40-ton trucks, these things don't exist yet. So um, uh, this is something which uh, is, although the technology 
time sh time scale is a lot shorter, the actual let's say phasing in takes a lot longer. Okay, and okay, there's a, a rather curious effect of, pri of price and demand. So you make um, you make renewables uh, cheaper, and you make energy cheaper because you're using more renewables, um, and that increases demand. So you end up having to reuse coal stations to keep your supplies going. So uh, you can have counterintuitive effects. Um, and then there is this other thing, which is this idea that um, from an economic point of view that we can have our oh, nuclear, wind and solar. Uh, well, from an economic point of view, these are actually competing <laughs> because all they do is they produce energy and in a, in a market these things are actually competing with each other. So in a way, this is one of those examples where you need a, let's say, something which is above the market, which is saying, no, we need nuclear, we need wind, and we need solar. Because otherwise, what will happen is you can have a collapse such that everybody goes towards nuclear or everybody goes towards solar. So um, there is a this competition going on here as well. Okay, Right, um, just before I move to the simulator itself, um, I'd just like to ask for a little bit of feedback at the end of the session, but also off, um, afterwards. Um, I'm going to, um, I'm going to, let's say, just put this. This is a very, very simple feedback form. I'm going to put it on the uh, on the chat. I think, maybe, yes, there it is, and. It should go okay. Um, this is f because uh, this is for me as a as a facilitator of this uh, this session. Okay, right. Um, just going to move over to Climate Interactive now. Okay, so this uh, this is why I wanted to uh, I wanted to uh, use the slides rather than the the, the website. This is the, this is the, the the, the training guide of the website, which is a bit, it's a bit dense, to be honest with you. Okay, but it's very, very complete. Um, I'll put this, I'll put this on the on the chat as well. Okay, uh, but this is very much <clears throat> for when you decide to actually take. Uh, Karma, Karma, it's not my form. So I can't. Uh, oh, what you could do is just put two, two words in, in an email or something. <laughs> it's not actually my form, so I can't. I can't do anything about that. Okay. Um, okay. So coming back to the the user guide, uh, very very detailed. When you get into the model, uh, this will help you. Um, let's say uh, understand what's happening the details of what's happening when you start to play around with the different levers. So this is the model. And I'm going to put this up. Again, I'm going to put this up on the chat. So just two seconds. <coughs> OK. Um, now, as I say, this this is a uh, this model is um, It's a standalone. It works on a website, so you don't have to download anything. Um, it's something that you can use in groups. You can use it in classes. You can uh, do all sorts of stuff with it, uh, and it just sits there on the web. You don't have to do any uh, any downloading or anything. Now, the first thing you notice that also this this particular version is in English, but I think there's all yeah you've got other uh, other versions as well if you if you want to have a look at in your in your own language. Um, so, what we have here is a, ra what, a rather fearsome dashboard. Okay, so we've got some we've got some graphs. We've got a big number here, and then we've got some stuff around here. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do in this particular session here is I'm going to just sort of show you what happens when you play around with some things and try to explain, um, let's say, uh, the effects 
that you may or may not see. Okay, so uh, I know that sounds a bit vague, but um, please bear with me. Okay, so we're starting. We're starting with a current scenario. Uh, this is the current scenario. It's the, uh, there's a blue line here, and there's a black line. Sorry, the, sorry. There's a, a baseline. This is our current scenario. Okay, the baseline is the black line, and then we we're going to change this, and then we're going to make some comparisons, um, and we're also we're also going to see what happens to to this number. Now. Um, Remember that Paris talked about a two degree, uh, a two degree uh, change. Okay, I'm trying to limit to a two degree, two degree change. So, just to give you two, uh, a couple of ideas about this. Let me just put this here. Did that copy over? No, it didn't. It's been a pain today. Okay, right, let's just see if this works. Oops, oh, that's died. Aye, aye, aye. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay, right, maybe it's coming back up again. Ah. Doesn't want to do this. Excuse me. Okay, I'm not. I'm not. I, I'll. I'll. I'll forward that later. Okay. So, um, hopefully you. Could, oh, no. This is. This is. This is not. Maybe not going to work. Okay. So, two degrees increase. Sorry, this is a bit slow. It's because the FCC is taking all the processing time, processing power. Okay. So, just to give you an idea. Uh, if the temperature, uh, okay, if the temperature goes up too much, uh, sorry about this. Okay, I'm going to close this one. I'm going to go back to the model. Okay, so the idea, sorry about that. Um, if the temperature goes up too much, uh, whole parts of the earth become uninhabitable. You can't grow crops. Uh, you've got oceans, uh, sea level rising, and the whole thing just gets really, really, really difficult. So this is why, this is why this idea of the two degree uh, temperature uh, limit is uh, is pretty important because even at two degrees, it makes life difficult. Okay. Okay. So um, let's just have a look at the uh, let's just have a look at this graph first. Okay. So this remember this is about energy. About energy sources. So we have coal, we have oil, we have gas. These are renewables. This is bioenergy, and bioenergy, remember, is biomass, which is burning wood and stuff. Uh, nuclear, interestingly, nuclear is like this high, it's just like this tiny, tiny, tiny thin strip on the top, so it's hardly relevant. And this is new sources of energy which we haven't really thought about okay so these are things which may may appear so let's just have a look at uh, what we can do and this is the uh, this is the the emissions the greenhouse emissions okay so if we look at our dashboard here we have uh, an energy supply we have transport we've got buildings growth land and industry emissions and carbon removal okay so we've got those elements that we had on the map uh, are sort of let's say more explicit here and what we can do is we can play with we can play with the model to see what happens if we uh, if we change if we do sort of particular things so for example um, something which is fairly reasonable. Let's look at energy supply first because this is uh, um, this is probably fairly reasonable in the context of we're not going to change population growth, uh, we're not going to change economic growth. So let's just have a look at population growth for a second. This is the 
<coughs> this is the UN um, prediction that there will be <coughs> a leveling off towards uh, uh, towards 2100. Okay, so if we want, we can actually change this. We can move this down. Okay, or we may we may we may predict uh, a population growth. Now let's just have a look at this. I'm just going to put it back to the status quo and notice, I want you to look at this graph here. Notice that this point is around about, well, 1,300, something like that. Let's just say population growth goes out of control. Notice that this increases and notice also that greenhouse gases increase and so does the temperature. Okay, so this is the, the thing about the modeling. Um, however, it, this is highly, un, it's highly unlikely that we would arrive at this point because all, all predictors point to a, um, let's say, a, a, a limit in the sense that people will, uh, as, as, we, as I said before, people typically have smaller families when they become more affluent for a, a series of reasons. Okay. So let's assume that this is this is going to stay uh, stay the way it is, and let's also assume that economic growth. Now, there's a long-term component and there's a short-term component. Now, this is averaged over uh, over different countries. So within here, you have some countries that are growing quickly. Uh, and you have some other countries which are not growing at all uh, or growing very slowly. Um, so I'm just going to leave this as it is, and I'm assuming that there w we can assume that there will be growth, normal growth as usual. Okay. So um, how do we get this growth? Well, you need energy. So let's just have a look at the uh, the thing. So where are you going to get the energy from? Well, we could have lots of different uh, sources, but looking at the looking at our graph at the moment in our current current situation, you can see that renewables are relatively small, a relatively small amount. Um, Bioenergy, which is basically burning wood, uh, is is more, uh, and gas, coal, and oil. These are the ones which are dominating. Okay, now you may say, okay, well let's make it less convenient to use oil. So what we can do is we can go into the oil uh, uh, the oil part and we say, okay, well, how do you make it less convenient? Well, increase the tax. Okay, well, for people in Italy, uh, <laughs> we, we know that the government always likes to add more tax onto oil anyway, so they've always done this. So I don't know whether it makes any difference here. But joking apart, sorry I'm joking, um, what you can say is okay well let's let's make it inconvenient. How much do you want to tax it? Well uh, let's put it as 20, 20, about $20, $20 a barrel or whatever it is okay uh, and while we can we can play with other factors in here. As I say, the model can be really quite, uh, it's quite sophisticated. But um, what it's saying here is that it's going, by doing this, we're going to pull the, let's say, the, the oil demand down, okay? Um, but have we done anything to the temperature? Yeah? So I'm just going to go back up and but it hasn't basically changed. So let me sort of say, okay, well, let's tax it a bit further. Let's make it really painful. Um, and it still hasn't had much of an effect. Well, what's happening is that oil is not just the stuff that you put in your cars. It's also used for, um, it's used for uh, other, uh, a lot of other energy for industry, for example. And that slack can be picked up by uh, other other fuels, like coal, for example. So let's just let's just let's just leave this at uh, highly taxed oil, and let's see if we can do something about coal. Now, coal is uh, is extremely is extremely carbon dense. Okay, so let's 
see if we can discourage the use of coal. So let's start to let's start to tax it. Now let's say okay, so uh, we're taxing it around about twenty dollars. Um, twenty dollars a ton for the carbon emitted. Um, we sort of we brought it down a little bit. Okay, so let's let's tax it further. Let's make it really sort of un, uneconomic. Okay, so this is we're starting to see some change. Okay, um, but this it's not a, it's still not enough. Okay, so what we can what we can basically do is we can say, uh, okay, what about natural gas? Um, because you will now notice that in the scenario, the gas line has gone above the baseline, but we didn't touch the gas line. Well, what's happened is that as people use uh, use less petrol and as they use less coal, they use more gas. Okay, so there's a compensation in the system. So let's tax gas. Let's make that unpopular as well. Let's make that uh, uh, well. Let's say it's a highly highly taxing. Okay, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to reduce the uh, trying to reduce the um, the amount of carbon stuff that's being used, but at the same time, um, this is contracting. But people want more energy, so we need to replace this somehow. Let's let's give a give a renewables a boost. Now, notice again. Notice that the this is the baseline, but the blue line represents what will happen if we tax the gas and the coal and the, and the oil, because people will start to pick up renewables in a bigger way. Uh, it's sort of an economic necessity, but we haven't actually done anything to encourage renewables. So let's, let's subsidize renewables. Let's give them... Uh, give them a bit of a boost. Let's see if this will actually work. Okay, so um, now this is uh, this is dollars per uh, kilowatt hour. So this is a small subsidy. This is a reasonable subsidy. This is a high subsidy. Let's give it a high subsidy. So we're we're really pushing this. Notice that the renewables are starting to starting to kick in, and they're starting to dominate. But we still have oil, uh, gas, oil, and coal. They are still there. Okay, um, we've got our temperature down a bit further. Okay, um, and this is assuming that we uh, we put in a subsidy for starting this year. Now let's say we aren't able to do that. Let's say we're able to do it in 2050. Okay, 2051. Um, okay, it's still a bit lower than it was, but it's not as good. We need to, in other words, what this is saying is that if you're going to do something, you need to act. We need to be acting uh, as soon as possible. So this is so. What you can see is you ha you're pulling different levers, and policy, and this is the political part of it. The policy is saying, okay, we're going to we're going to tax coal. Um, we're going to tax oil, we're going to tax natural gas. And so the thing here is that the, when you increase the prices of, uh, of, of energy, um, quite often it's the, it's the poorest people in, the, in society that disproportionately uh, have problems with, the, uh, with being able to, let's say, um, pay for the energy that they need. Okay, so uh, you can you can tax some stuff and you can incentivize other stuff, um, but you may need you may still you will still have a transition period. Notice that you make the change now, but it's only it only starts to become a lot more relevant as you go further into the future. And you still have gas, oil, and coal. You haven't got rid of them. Okay, and these are the ones which are still contributing in a major way. Okay, so what about uh, what about nuclear? Well, nuclear is a bit of a problem because uh, it's it's true it's not a carbon technology, 
but it has it has uh, big economic costs because you have waste and you have uh, um, you have things which you have to manage and you have to deal with potential environmental problems uh, going forward into the future. So. Uh, in, and in some countries, this is this is not an option. Um, so you could say, well, okay, let's just leave nuclear as it is. We don't we don't want nuclear because that's just shifting the problem. Um, what about some new technologies, maybe? Uh, so let's say there is a new discovery made, a zero carbon breakthrough. So. This could be something like uh, a really cheap way of making hydrogen because hydrogen is a fa fantastic fuel if you can get it to burn properly in the sense that if you can get it to burn in a controlled way. Um, it has its disadvantages. It's highly flammable. Uh, it's explosive in contact with oxygen. <laughs> okay. And a flame, uh, so you do need to handle it very carefully. But these are technological problems which which can be solved, okay? Because there are already solutions. It's just they're not very economical. Um, what about uh, being able to produce um, hydrogen by direct solar-powered electrolysis, which is extremely efficient? Lots of work is being done on this type of stuff and progress is being made it just it will take time so how much time do we think we have well let's assume that uh, this is this is something which is going to happen there's a lot of research you know there's a a, a new startup in uh, in in Busselengo near near Verona okay and they these guys are really clever and they've got they've got a breakthrough coming coming out, and it's just gonna it's just gonna happen, okay? Um, but it takes ten years to get the stuff onto the market, yeah. So let's assume that uh, they're even good at commercial and scaling it up. I mean, it's this just it's just such a fantastic idea that this will really sort of take off. Um, but how? how expensive is it compared to coal because that's the competitor yeah uh, on a co on a cost scale notice let's say it's extremely expensive compared to coal no one is really bothered with it it's too expensive it has to be extremely cheap now if it's half the cost of coal then people will start to will start to to take it up okay so this might be something that could happen uh, I'm not saying that it would take five years it would probably take ten years that's the average and well breakthrough year uh, maybe a little bit further 2040 okay so you can see that this is starting to kick in now 2040 I'm not being morbid about it, but I don't think I'm going to be around to see that. Yeah. So this is again, this is this thing about the the delays in the system. Just because someone says on on the news this evening that there's a fantastic new technology for making lots and lots of hydrogen extremely cheaply, you can't buy it tomorrow in the supermarket. Okay, you're going to have to wait. Yeah. Okay. So, but this is. This is having its having its impact, but we're still not there. So um, we've got some uh, we've got some new technologies. So we've, we're changing the energy mix. What about efficiency? What about looking at uh, efficiency? So let's say that there's a big change in uh, public transport, or there are new. Uh, uh, there could be more public tra expanded public transport networks, there are more uh, hy hybrid cars or more electric cars and stuff. Let's say that the f energy efficiency increases by about 2% per year. That's a lot, actually. Okay, Where does that energy efficiency come from? Well, it can come from um, 
come from innovative ways of um, moving around. So, for example, uh, the explosion in, not literally explosion, but the, the explosion in the use of these, um, these uh, what are they called, uh, monopatini, the uh, skates, uh, um, these skaters uh, that fly around the city at stupid speeds and look extremely dangerous, but they are definitely taking cars off, uh, cars off the road. Um, electric bikes, more buses, uh, local policies for making <coughs> for making the um, making parking in the centre of the city extremely unattractive. Okay, so for example, here you drive into the centre of the city, and if you don't live there, you get a fine. Okay, um, let's assume that this is going to uh, is going to uh, is going to take off uh, fairly soon. So um, we're bringing the temperature down, but what about electrification? Let's see. Um, let's say that we're going to uh, use more widespread uh, electrification, so electric cars, trucks, buses, but also with policies to take the old vehicles off the off the road. So part of this is uh, we see this with the incentives. You take in your old car and they give you six thousand euros off an extremely expensive electric car. Okay, we're not quite there yet on the prices, but it's good. It's good. It's coming. It's coming just like solar. Uh, the, the price of solar will uh, the price of solar fell. Uh, these these things will uh, will take uh, take place. And as someone explained to me, someone who worked in um, works in Volkswagen explained to me that uh, he wasn't trying to sell me a car. Um, he was telling me that the electric vehicles that we see these that we see now look like cars because they have to look like cars because consumers won't buy a car that does not look like a car. It won't be long before the technology, before the technology, let's say, takes over, because technologically speaking, um, an electric motor doesn't have to, doesn't have to be made in the same way as a, as a, as a, a, a car which runs on, uh, on, on uh, petrol. You don't have to organise things the same way. You can direct drive the drive the wheels. Uh, you can do all sorts of stuff. You don't have a fuel tank. Um, things could be completely different. So, let's say um, electrification starts and we we incentivise it to about 20%. Okay. Um, let's say this starts uh, fairly fairly soon. Um, now. Air and water. I can see water transport happening. I, I don't think I'd like to go in an electric plane, though. I'm not so sure about that. Um, but let's say there's some there's an equivalent uh, uh, increase there. So you can see that we're sort of bringing this down, and we're reducing the net emissions. Okay, but there's still there's still a uh, there's still a lot to do because we have to get this down to two. Okay, what about buildings and industry? So everybody knows that all buildings are extremely inefficient. Um, so we can uh, we can uh, incentivize um, uh, incentivize uh, energy efficiency in buildings. So this is one thing that the Italian government is doing at the moment uh, to because. A lot of buildings in the cities were built in, built in the 60s and 70s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and they don't have the thermal insulation which is available these days. So people are uh, are applying to to get help uh, because it, it costs a lot to uh, to basically clad a building in um, uh, in polystyrene to to insulate it. Okay, so let's say that uh, we start to improve the um, uh, the, the insulation of the buildings uh, and let's say we, we're sort of doing this at 5% a year, this is fine. So what I'm doing here is I'm just walking through how you could work uh, work through a model. Um, I think one, one thing I've noticed with uh, simulations with students is that if you give this to a bunch of teenagers they just randomly <laughs> move the levers around, okay, um, there has to be some sort of let's say thought thought behind it.
Um, so you can't just say, okay, we're going to tax, we're going to put a big tax on coal uh, and nothing on oil, because all that will do is it'll just shift things over, over to oil. But you can see that, you can model it, okay? You can see what would happen. Oh, what if everything went on coal and nothing went on oil, okay? So this is the power of this model. Um, thinking sort of further about electrification, uh, new buildings, uh, let's say, well, this is, this is interesting because um, many, many new buildings uh, are, uh, particularly industrial buildings, are being put up with um, uh, solar cells, solar panels on the roofs, uh, which uh, typically are large roof spaces. Um, and according to what your industry is, according to what you're doing, your power needs may be completely satisfied by uh, these types of uh, these types of interventions. Um, so again, you can uh, you can map this. Okay, I said we'd leave these two alone, and that leaves the last uh, the last set of um, the last set of uh, uh, of of, of, uh, of interventions here. So. Um, what we have with deforestation um, is that uh, this is something which is happening at a certain rate, okay? So we have two things. We have two parts of this. We have the deforestation and the afforestation, which is uh, actually actively planting trees. Now, um, of course, one of, the, one of the key things for Deforest, for, for, for forests is that they are carbon sinks. They take the carbon dioxide and they use it. Um, so there has to be some sort of balance between, uh, let's say, um, cutting forests down and having new forests in order to make sure that that sink is not, is not lost. So let's assume that we, <coughs> we actually managed to uh, reduce our deforestation by 5%. Okay, now this is being extremely aggressive. What does this mean? It means that if we cut down 100 today, 100 this year, we cut down 95 next year. Okay, so some people would say this is absolutely not enough. I would agree with you, but let's be let's be let's be reasonable with the model just to see how it works out. So you can see that this is starting to bring the temperature down again. Um, what about methane? So this is uh, methane, another gas. So you've got um, uh, emissions from um, agriculture, emissions from industry. Okay, so we can reduce, let's say we start to eat more vegetables. Now, let's say you start eating soya. Everybody starts eating soya. Well, unfortunately, that is, that, that is extremely bad for deforestation because what often happens is that forests are cut down and replaced with monocultures like soya to satisfy people typically in the West, okay, who are now clamoring for, uh, for meat substitutes, okay. So there has to be, uh, there have, there have to, there has to be, uh, let's say, other ways of doing this. But for example, um, there is a, there are the ideas of sustainable cities, which are in which food is no longer produced in fields, but it's produced in recycled uh, factory spaces under artificial conditions. Well, um, <laughs> everybody knows. <laughs> that uh, uh, the cannabis is produced on a large scale in factory conditions. So let's say the agronomy is well understood and it's well known. And in fact, um, uh, in Holland, they produce a lot of tomatoes. They produce a, a massive number of tomatoes in uh, controlled conditions. Okay. So uh, there, are, there, are, there are potential ways of ra around this. Perhaps uh, soya beans can be produced hydroponically in a much more efficient manner without cutting down uh, forests. Okay, so um, we can, let's say we manage to, pr to reduce our, uh, our methane and other gases by around about a third. 
Okay, so we, we make some agricultural changes now, of course. Um, we could look at some detailed uh, settings. Uh, I'm not going to go there for, for now. We're going to run out of time. Okay, so, so this is, all of these things are things which are contributing, potentially, or not contributing if you've got zero carbon technology. Here, carbon removal, we've got stuff which is actively taking. So um, let's start planting trees. So, um, so this is uh, this is an interesting statement because um, we think, okay, well, it's enough to plant trees. Well, you have to plant the right trees. And in many cases, the right trees for that particular place are maybe they're not the trees which are uh, quick growing and taking in the uh, taking in the carbon dioxide. So I'm thinking in particular of the of the, the pine forests in some parts of the UK, which uh, from a distance, yeah, OK, look at that nice forest up on the hillside. Um, but they have been described as biodiversity deserts because you have monoculture Sitka spruce. It grows like, uh, it grows like a rocket. Um, you can harvest it for wood very, very quickly within 10, 15, 20 years. Um, but this is the, not necessarily the sort of afforestation that you really want because you can have a very bad effect on biodiversity. And biodiversity, which is not really present in this model because it's it, it's not it's not part of the energy system. Um, biodiversity is incredibly important for food supply in terms of insects, etc., etc., pollinators. Okay, so uh, but let's just say we are we're, we're planting trees and we're planting the right ones. So let's let's say we start ah. Uh, let's do a qu about a quarter of the uh, of the, the available land that you could use for afforestation because you can't plant trees anywhere and not all land is available for planting trees so uh, you know you have to be uh, you have to be reasonable about this okay notice we're sort of coming down a bit uh, so we're sort of creeping down and you can see that our uh, our greenhouse emissions are uh, are coming uh, coming down okay what about a technological fix now one of the i think one of the dangers of uh of this and I, I again i i hear this with students sometimes is there's almost like oh well a, a technology will save us type of thing uh and we have to be very careful because technologies can be good technologies can be bad it, Quite often, it's just how you use them. Um, but also, there's um, there's a, a strong, let's say, sense of uh, um, <sighs> this is the the saviour. Okay. Well, I think one of the things that you will be able to pick up from my demonstrating this model is that. Um, OK, I've been sort of fairly, fairly bland about things because I wanted to show you the different parts. But um, no one thing, no one thing is going to actually uh, it's going to actually do the business in the sense that um, we need different, several different approaches working together. And so we have to be very careful about debates which uh, move us all from one thing onto another we need uh, we need a mix of stuff so let's just see let's say that we manage to come up with uh, a, a good carbon dioxide removal technology um, there's all sorts of ways of doing this uh, they're not particularly it's not particularly advanced at the moment and there's a, there's a lot of work being uh, sort of going on about this but let's say we manage to um, we managed to capture we managed to capture around about 27 30 percent of the uh, of the carbon dioxide so we introduced this this capture technology so we sort of brought this down to about 2.6 okay so ha huh, is that enough no it's not the one thing that the two th oh, the two things that i haven't looked at here are 
back in the energy supply and I just I just noticed that uh, I didn't do anything. Um, okay, so discourage or encourage the use of trees or forest waste. Bioenergy is a problem because it's still producing CO2. We don't want people burning wood. You don't want people burning vegetation and stuff because you're still producing CO2. So um, I would suggest that you actually tax it and you make it less uh, less attractive because it doesn't make much sense in the sense that you are you're just uh, contributing to the uh, to the uh, to the overall CO2. Let's just see what happens if we. Okay, it hasn't changed the temperature, but what you have done is you've uh, you've increased the demand and it's just moved up to another level. Okay, so I'm going to tax it. I think taxing is sounds like sounds like a good idea. Okay, so the last thing is carbon price. Okay, well carbon price is a bit of a uh, is a bit of a, a political one because uh, we need to think about whether we do want to tax carbon product carbon dioxide producers for the carbon dioxide that they produce. So at the moment there is no carbon tax tax. So let's tax it to about 40, 50. Yeah, there we go, about 50. Okay, right. So in other words, the more carbon dioxide you produce, the more tax you pay. So we've got out, we've got down to about 2.3. Okay, now um, the way I'll just in the last few minutes, the, the way En-ROADS works in a in a workshop situation uh, in a workshop situation is obviously you'll be in a room, you'd be debating. Uh, Okay, you're going to put a tax on on carbon sources, so uh, coal, oil, natural gas. Um, you put a carbon price on people who are burning carbon. Okay, so uh, all of these things, and you would have different groups of people representing, for example, the oil industry, the coal industry, uh, the renewables industry. Of course, these guys want to be highly subsidised, but of course, these guys don't want to be highly taxed. Yeah, so this is this is where the let's say the simulation thing comes in because you can say well okay you have to maybe people are relying on coal if you close the coal mines what are people going to do? Well, yes, there are there are societal let's say consequences of of uh, of. Um, of, of decisions around uh, around energy. Now, this is something which happened in the UK in the 1980s. The coal mines were closed, okay, uh, and manufacturing was moved over, over towards uh, services. Um, but the thing is, in many cases, uh, you have economies which are really quite reliant on uh, on these more traditional uh, or these traditional hydrocarbon. Uh, uh, energy sources, and it would be very difficult for them to change rapidly. And politically, it would be extremely di it's extremely difficult for them, uh, extremely difficult for them to do anything. Okay, so when you do this with a with a group of people, you are um, you're typically in get also engaging in the debate about uh, uh, resources and. Um, how much you're going to put in one sphere compared to uh, compared to another? Okay. Right now, I realise I've I've probably completely bamboozled you here because this is <laughs> extremely complicated, <laughs> extremely complex, uh, extremely complex thing. Now I'm just wondering. Yeah, yeah. I've, you've got the link to the scenario builder. Uh, I would suggest I would suggest that you take it away, you've got the whole summer, take it away and play with it. Um, one of the other ways that this gets used is um, you can set up teams and see, uh, uh, see, how, see who can sensibly, that's the key thing, sensibly get to the target. Because as I say, let's just sort of take, all, take this all the way down. 
and let's just tax the hell out of oil, coal and gas and it's still not doing anything. Um, I'm going to whack all the highly subsidised, I'm going to whack the carbon price, there you go, that's, that's the key to it. Um, but let's see how much that is. $250 a ton, that's a lot, okay? That means you won't be flying Ryanair anywhere. Okay, let's just say you uh, increase the electrification, energy efficiency, all of this sort of stuff. Uh, plant loads of forests, um, massive growth in carbon capture technology, um, e extreme reduction in methane, extreme reduction in deforestation. Okay, so I've just <laughs> turned the knobs up as far as I could. Okay, um, let's let's just go for zero. Uh, we're going to go for low growth. We don't care about growing anymore. Um, I'm not going to touch the population. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. I'll I'll show you. Eh, eh, eh. Not really. Not minus two. <laughs> But uh, okay, but so I mean, joke, joking aside, joking aside. Oops, that's my um, joking aside. This is uh, I've seen many simulators over the years, and I, this is this is the most sophisticated. It might be complex to say, uh, but at first sight, it seems very much into it and a good way to start. I think you're right. I think you're right, actually, Marion, because. Um, it makes people think about, well, if you take from one place, almost certainly there is a compensation in the system. This is part of the complex complexity of the thing. So you, um, you, you, ha you, you subsidize renewables and maybe you don't do anything with, with uh, you just leave coal and oil at the, sta at the status quo. Okay, um, this will take a little while for it to uh, come back, I think. Let me just... Um, but you will... It's the economic growth one that's the big one. There we go. Uh, but you will you will notice that... Um, and afforestation, I have to take that back to... And deforestation back up here. And technologic technology is not going to save us. Okay, and we have to, and we're not going to get rid of that much methane. These guys have a big effect. Yeah, so um, it's the, it is this idea of, uh, and that's the one. Take it down. Okay, there we go. Notice, see what happened there. 2.2 carbon price. Make people pay. You make the polluter pay, but of course that passes the cost on to everybody in the economy, so prices are, are higher, and that will suppress growth. Okay, but uh, but yeah, it's this idea of you have uh, it's like you have connecting vessels, and if you pour water into one, it will pour into the others and according to how fast you pour uh, it will move uh, it will move between the different vessels okay any anybody got any any questions for the last couple of minutes before I before I sign off or before <laughs> Okay, right. Anybody got a, qu a question? Hmm. Anybody got any uh, questions or comments? Uh, I can unmute the. Uh, okay, so you've unmuted everybody on the is it? Okay. Any comments? Was the, was have you seen? Has anyone seen this before? Hey. This is Marian from Spain, not as intuitively. Mm -hmm. I have uh, seen some other simulators mm -hmm. uh, some times ago, but this this is very very nice for the schools, I think. Yeah. Because I th you start to to move 
uh, or to change what would change with energy supply changes mm -hmm. and you you see very easily what is the consequence yeah, of exactly, doing exactly. one exactly. or another thing. I think it's very much interesting for for yeah, the exactly. educational context. Yeah, also exactly. for for little children, not only for uh, high levels in the school, but for primary schools, it's very nice. And so I, I like. Yeah, it. I mean, I th I think okay, maybe maybe for pri maybe for primary, it's it, it looks a bit complicated. But what you can do, I think, is maybe. Uh, just sort of concentrate on particular things. So, for example, what do primary school kids know or need to know about the coal industry? Probably not, not a lot. No, but, but maybe cer certainly the, the thing about the deforestation and afforestation, yeah. that type of. Thing. Um, and so you can see, you can see, you can keep everything constant. It's a bit like a scientific experiment. You keep them all constant, and then you can change uh, and see what see what happens. Yeah. Um, possibly and I, I do mean this series uh, possibly one of the one of the challenges is to relate this number which is apparently quite small to something which is such a big such a big effect I think um, because it's it's easy particularly with people who maybe are not so and I'm not talking about children here I'm talking about adults people who are not so um, uh, knowledgeable about the the, the 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 science part of it. <sighs> yeah. Well, if if my average temperature is two degrees warmer, I'm a bit happier because I suffer from rheum <laughs> rheumatism anyway. So I'm uh, I'm a bit warmer in the winter. Yeah. And it's sort of mm, yeah. Because it, it, the numbers are not spectacular. That's the thing. The numbers are the uh, behind this. Behind this, we have gigatons, gigatons of carbon dioxide. But what's a gigaton? It's just too big. Yeah. Has anybody got? Th th thank you, Marion. It's, it's a good, it's good, nice comment. Uh, I, th I think. Um, I think it's it's well worth playing with, and with the older children, with the older students, older children, older students, um, once they get over the uh, initial <laughs> sort of playing around with the levers, um, the older it, students for, for sure, and also this together with some documental or some kind of uh, film. Is well, okay, great, okay, so. uh, right. If you if you want if you want documentary stuff. Uh, if you go on the if you go on the the, the website, okay, um, there is loads and loads and loads of stuff. There are some re some really really uh, nice videos here. This is John Sturman. This is the guy who one of the guys who developed system dynamics. Um, there's a lot of really excellent material, really excellent material here, uh, and it's well worth uh, it's well worth the time spent uh, looking at it. So thank you, thank you very much, Gordon, for all the, these lessons, also for this uh, last day before summer, because it's very, very interesting to do it. Thank you. No, I, I, I feel really passionate about this stuff, so I, I, I really felt that this is an opportunity to, to, to bring it to, the, to a, a wider audience, because you, you need to know this stuff and, and take it away and uh, take it to the next generation. That's the, that's the thing. And yeah, you know, that, that's you guys have got a really, really important role in that. Okay, right. So it's 18:59. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to sign off. Uh, I hope I hope this hasn't been too traumatic for people. Um, if you have any if you have any questions, uh, you can sort of contact me through. Uh, if you don't know my email, you can contact contact me through Europol. Um, I'm quite happy to uh, to try and answer any questions that uh, that you may have. Please, 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 can you send me a little bit of feedback because I'm uh, I'm doing the ambassador thing, so I need a bit of feedback from some participants of a workshop, okay? Uh, and that way I can sort of uh, do more more of these workshops, okay? Okay. And have a good have a good summer. Enjoy. Okay. Enjoy. Okay. Thank you very much, Gordon. Uh, it was very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. And I would like to thank all the participants, too. 
and I wish to, um, yes, I'd like to wish you a great summer to all of you. Uh, rest <laughs> a lot and have fun during this summer. And the next meeting will be in September, yes, uh, the 6th, I think, I yeah. think. Yeah, I think uh, at the beginning. At 4 p.m. Yes, that's right. Six, uh, 16.30, half past four. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you will receive uh, an email a few days before. Okay. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. And goodbye. Good thank you very much. Have a good summer. Okay. Bye. Yes. Have a great summer. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.